Okay, and we're live. <laughs> okay. Okay, Yolanda. I'm Old Grim, and today I'm speaking to Nabila Tejpar about her career as a rally driver. Hi, Nabila. Hi, how are you? Very well, thank you. Um, we can see the cars in the background, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. Um, I was asked to put together some info about you, and I wasn't sure what, what to say because we know each other, but I didn't know a whole lot about your career. So I put your name into Google, and I think over a thousand hits came back. Uh, which, if nothing else, shows that you're super famous. Um, you, um, and the gist I got was that, that driving is in your blood and it's part of the family tradition. Uh, and that's, that's essentially how you got into it. But I guess the first thing that everyone would, would want to know is, that, you know, how did that all start? How old are you? That sort of thing. Of course. So um, I've been driving now for about five years. I actually started quite late. I tried a rally car when I was 16 for the first time, but I always joked when I was a little kid saying, I want to be a racing driver when I grow up. And obviously no one ever thought anything of it. And it wasn't until a friend of mine bought a car down to near where I live and I tried it and I sort of sat in the car and drove it. And I was like, oh my God, I, I actually love this. Like, this is what I want to do with my life. And so I took that information back to my parents and they laughed at me. Well, why do they laugh at you? Because they're like, as if, like, what, what? That doesn't make any sense. Why would you all of a sudden want to go into, go into rallying? Like, that doesn't make any sense. So my grandfather and my father used to compete. And dad did it at quite a high level. But unfortunately, my grandfather passed away when he was quite young. So he had to take over the family business. In which case, that meant that his rallying career was over for him, sadly. But um, no, so we ended up doing, um, so I ended up, saying to my parents I really want to try this and I want to get my license and see what happens but my mum said no <laughs> she said to me you have to go to university first you have to get a degree because you have to have a backup plan like what's the chances that this is actually going to work out and I said okay fine so I went to university I studied international business and I went to the US to study and then I came back and in her mind, I think she expected me to come back and forgotten all about it and just go get a job. Um, but that didn't happen. And the first thing I did, I graduated early, came home, handed my mum the degree and said, right, I'm going rallying now. And um, <laughs> she, she's a person of her word. So she had to, so she had to agree. And um, that's how I started. So I didn't start competing until I was 21. Oh, wow. So you're exceptional in a number of ways, but one of them is definitely managing to convince your parents to not make you a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant. So um, that's awesome. And when you when you went into the rally car for the first time, was that also the first time you'd driven or had you been driving before that? So I learned to drive when I was 12 in the fields with my dad. So like the first thing I learned how to do in a car was handbrake turns in a normal road car. And um, yeah, so dad always had wanted to teach me early and I, and I just sort of learned, learned on private land. And um, I didn't get my license until I was 18 though, because I moved out to the US. And so I missed like getting my license at 17 here and you had to get it, you had to wait a whole year on a permit over there. So I didn't actually start driving till I was, till I was 18, like yeah. legally. <laughs> to, be, to be crystal clear for anyone watching, no one's advocating driving between 12 and 18 without a license, right? Absolutely not. And I never did it. I only did it in private property on fields. <laughs> okay. And so you passed your driving test. I guess, did you still keep your, your hand in driving while you were at university as well? Um, I only got the chance to drive my car once. What we did is... Um, Dad said, right, I need to see if there's actually going to be any potential here and whether this is worth doing or whether you're just saying this because you drove a car around the field and fell in love with it. Like, I need to see. So I did get to, on my first summer, I came back and I went over to Wales, did a test day with a, uh, a rally driver called Mark Higgins. And um, he taught me some things and relayed to my dad that there's some potential there and it would be worth giving it a shot. So we were like, okay. And then my mum said, all right, that's it. No more finish your degree. I don't want to hear anything about it for the next, for the next three years. And I was like, okay, I did convince my dad to let me drop out of university, but obviously that wasn't allowed. Okay, fine. And it sounds like your, like a lot of your driving, um, enjoyment, passion experiences come from your dad. And so whatever they said on the outside, he must've been 
absolutely made up for, that that's what you wanted to end up doing with your life. Yeah, I think it surprised him in the beginning. Like, I think a part of him wished that maybe we'd thought, considered it earlier and I'd ended up doing some karting when I was younger and done some autocross and things like that, just so that I could learn, like, learn a little bit more. But I think in hindsight, it was never anything that anyone expected to happen. So as much as we say like, oh, what if, that's just sort of how that came about. And now he does say to me, it, he lives vicariously through me. So uh, I hope, I think he hopes as much as I hope that I'll make it to like the top level. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure there are many others that will be living vicariously through you as well. Um, so in going to the other end of your career, I know you have a very long list of achievements. Um, but which one of those or, or two stand out the most uh, so far? So one of the ones that's definitely like stood out to me was I got the chance to compete on WRC Portugal, which is a World Rally Championship round in, um, a, jun in a junior category class, which is the car that I've been driving for the last few years. And um, I finished third in that class on that event and it's probably one of the toughest events I've ever done in my life. It was 40 degrees outside. The stages were anywhere between like 12 kilometers and 50 kilometers. And it was just so tough because the roads by the time that we get through them because um, they go in category of classes. And so they've got like the, the WRC cars, which are the fastest and they're four wheel drive and they tear up the whole road. So by the time we get there and our little R2s, which are a front wheel drive car, it's so difficult to like make sure that you don't get a puncture and to be able to keep going. So yeah, that was definitely one of my biggest accomplishments. And I was happy with that. Awesome. And, and a lot of people probably aren't familiar with rally driving, even as a concept, forget getting in a, in a rally car. And so how would you explain it to, to those people? Like what, what does it feel like when you're driving? Okay, so what I do is I normally like differentiate that motorsport isn't just racing because that's the first thing people think when there's motorsport. Motorsport has a number of different disciplines. So racing is like going around a track, then there's hill climbs, uh, sprints, uh, off-road. There's so many different disciplines and rallying is one of those. But rallying in particular is the, basically in simplified terms, is the fastest point from point A to point B. So it's time trials more or less. So you'd never actually on the same piece of road as anybody else. They start at one minute intervals and it's seeded over time. So um, you'll have a car going and then a minute later, another car and a minute later, another car. So you'll have multiple cars in the stage, but never at the same point. And um, the, the winner of the event or the rally is the person that does every stage in the least amount of time. So you could be leading the first day and by the Sunday, the person who was ninth could be leading because there's been problems or someone had punctures. And I mean, I know someone that's lost a rally on the last stage because they got a puncture and they dropped from first to third in like one, one stage. So um, that's how I would explain rallying. And I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Um, yeah, it makes make sense to me. Um, and then I suppose the follow up to that is, what does it feel like when you're inside the car? How, how do you describe that? There's nothing quite like it. It's probably one of the hardest things I ever have to put into words. And it's a question I'm asked a lot. But um, just the feeling of being in that one in the car obviously you've got your co-driver who's calling pace notes to you that's also another differentiation in rallying we have a second person in the car so we don't actually know where we're going two days before the event we write all of our pace notes which is basically the guide and then the co-driver tells us that when we're going down the stage so it's like being in that one environment just with that one person telling you the pace notes and it's just the adrenaline the adrenaline sorry it's incredible like there's nothing quite like it that I don't think about anything else when you're sat in that car. Like you just sort of end up zoning into yourself and just feeling the road and the car and like the conditions that are coming at you. And it's just incredible. I mean, I've had times where I've had three different, no, I've had all different seasons in one stage. We had hail, we had snow, we had sunshine. It was, it was mad. And that's all just, it's all just the fun of it. Um, and have you ever had a crash while you were driving? Yes, I've had many. <laughs> Um, unfortunately you can't go into rallying without having the expectation that you are going to crash and I've, I've done that a couple of times quite epically um, 
And I'm one of those people that always gets the chance, you know, to have my crushes in front of where there's TV cameras. <laughs> yeah, no, I've had a couple of big ones. Um, my first year, I had one in Scotland. And then at the end of last year, I lost my championship because I crashed. <laughs> Maybe the presumption for a lot of people listening is that because it's a motorsport, crashing isn't part and parcel, or maybe that's just my own ignorance. How, how do you recover from something like that? Firstly, the, the physical part of a crash, but then, as you said, to lose a championship on it, like the mental yeah. part of that. Well, we always have, they have a saying in motorsport that if you're not crashing, you're not trying hard enough. <laughs> so, I mean, you're obviously going to find the limit at some point, And that normally is when you, when you end up in a crash. So you've got to like test those limits. But, um, the first accident I ever had, I um, got a lot of questions from my parents saying, is this something you want to carry on doing? Like, are you sure about this? But my, I add, when I say I have these accidents, these cars are built for this. Like there's roll cages, we're fully um, harnessed in with a five point harness. We've got neck protection, we've got helmets, we've got fireproof suits. Like these cars are built to take the damage that is inflicted on it. Like there's people who have rolled 15 times and walked out the car without any issues. Like there's guys that have rolled down the sides of cliffs. Like these cars are built for that. So it's not as dangerous as you think. Obviously motorsport is dangerous and I'm not gonna say it's not, it hundred percent is, but it's very, very safe. And the FIA and the governing bodies make sure that they've put in homologation papers and everything to make sure that these cars are up to standard. But, um, I think getting out of that car, the only thing I did was look at it and go, oh my God, my dad's going to kill me. <laughs> it was never the fact of like, I was scared about getting back in the car, that it never phased me. I think I always worried about crashing, but once I'd experienced it and realized that it's really not as bad as you expect. I mean, I literally said as we were rolling, this really isn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I don't know. I think we have a screw loose in our brain, first of all. But um, I think when you're passionate about something and you know that there's something that you want to do, it doesn't matter how many times you get knocked down. You've just got to make sure you keep getting back up and trying again. So um, that, was the, that was the same for me. And then the one with my championship, I sort of just had to park it on the side and be like, OK, what's meant to have happened, happened. And like, you can't change it. So what are we going to do about it next year? And, and so I'm sure there are a lot of young, aspiring sportsmen and women who are probably going to watch videos of you on YouTube now. Uh, but the, the message is to not try what you're doing at home because they don't have the same degree of safety in their own cars that they're probably driving around the roads of. Yeah, I don't ever recommend doing what we do in a riding car in a road car. <laughs> Um, I, what, one of the things maybe, I, I don't know if you're all, all, always aware of, but you're, you're a role model for loads of young men, women, um, inside the Jamaat and outside. And so how does, how does that make you feel? I won't lie, it's really strange. <laughs> Never in my life did I expect to be a role model for people. I look up to role models and I have my ones, especially in my sport and things like that and in the community. But it's a bit surreal to say that I'm classed as one of those because I don't feel like I've done enough or achieved enough or had enough of my life to be one. But it's nice to be able to encourage, um, encourage everybody into sports. I know, um, especially as an Asian community and or Asian communities generally, sports never really considered as a viable option. And if I can do anything and at least become a role model to show that any kind of sport is an option, so long as you've got the grounds and basics and you're gonna work hard at it. I mean, you've got to work hard at anything you do. And I think it's the same in this aspect, but I think that would be nice to be able to, look, to, to promote and teach people that sport is an option. Yeah, I, I, think, that, I think that's super important. Um, and, and so if you had you know, one, one piece of advice for, for people watching, well, I'm sure you get asked this all the time, but what, what would it be apart from hard work? Um, to never give up. So there'll be points in time where you reach a point and you're like, why am I doing this? Why did I do that? Why didn't I just go get a job or like you'll sit there and question everything you've done I've done it many a times and then you sit there and you're like actually hold on a second no because I've said I'm going to do this and I'm going to try everything in my power to make sure I do it so what I do is I set myself mini goals and like so it's easier to achieve the, the small goals on the way to the big goal so then you don't feel defeated and you don't feel you failed and I mean like everything and 
everything. There is um, a saying that I go by that failure is the key to success. If you don't hit those mini tumbles along the way, then either you're extremely gifted and I'm jealous and I wish I was like that, but otherwise you're just human. Like we all have those where I'm thinking even in normal life, you fail or you don't quite come up to where you want to be at, even in your job or anything. And so long as you can look past that and realize that that failure was there to help you reach the next stage and to learn from it, I think that's probably the biggest advice that I have. I hope people watching at uh, home are writing this down because uh, that's some very sage advice from a very successful young lady. Uh, okay, so turning slightly, um, what what kind of car do you drive right now when you're not racing properly? When I'm not racing, I drive a Fiesta, just okay. a little Fiesta EcoBoost, nothing special. Fine, and what are the cars behind you? So these cars behind me yeah, are, yes. uh, this is my dad's car. So he still does a little bit of competing himself. And um, so he drives in the historic categories, which I don't, I mean, they're cool. They're great cars. Like these are classics, but they're not quite what I drive. Oh, you mean you mean the category is called historic, not, not your dad? Because that would be very rude if that's what you're saying. <laughs> no, of course I mean the cars. <laughs> okay, all right. So um, these are like pre-1975 cars. So they're classed as a historic category. And um, the car behind that is a very, very famous riding car. Um, it's a uh, Mark II Escort, and it was driven by some really incredible drivers like Ari Vatanen and Timo Mackinen. And I know no one's going to understand that, but anyone who knows riding, especially out in Kenya, they all definitely know what these cars are. Okay, cool. Well, I'm, I'm sure people will, will be inspired to go and have a look into that. Um, okay, and, and you've, you've talked about um your dad quite a bit and, and yourself as a role model uh, who who have you looked up to through your career either in rally or, or outside rally so there's a few people one of the so definitely my parents and um not just my dad my mum my mum is one of those people that like just knows what to say at the right time and um i think that's super helpful and i'm very lucky that i've had the support of my parents through all of this so they're definitely role models to me and what i wish to and hope to be like in the future and um, I do have a few within rallying um, one of them is Michelle Moutard she's the only female to have ever made it to the top level of WRC and won races and that was back in the 1980s she's definitely inspired me to be able to try and be the next one or at least encourage more people to find rallying as a sport especially women and know that it's an option for them to and that we do have the potential just as she did to get to the top level and um, of course then the WRC drivers at the moment they're absolutely incredible they're at the top of their game they're everything I aspire to be and um, I've been lucky enough to have conversations with them and get advice from them so definitely the whole rallying community is like a role basically. Okay that's that's awesome um, and then you you mentioned that you know a, a female and Asian these are not typically the the kinds of diversity we see at the top end of a lot of sport and so has that hindered your progression anyway or has it been the opposite i'll be honest as a kid and like growing up and going to school i never noticed the fact that we were asian and my friends were white like it's race was never anything that i even or thought about and I don't think it's been until the last few years in my sport where I have actually started to realize that hold on a second there is a massive difference there is times where I am the only Asian or let alone person of color generally in an entire room in motorsport and um, I think what Lewis Hamilton is trying to do in racing and motorsport generally is something that's really important so um, yeah no motorsport especially rallying there is barely any any diversity at all so to be female and to also be asian is it's quite something in a sport like this and i think we're definitely seeing more growth of women in the sport which is nice and in the whole of motorsport but i think it will be a while before we start to see more of an equal basis of diversity within it uh, and, and with everything going on uh, right now in the world around diversity and racism um it, yeah, you're somewhat of a shining light for all of that stuff and so even if you know whatever you're doing the fact that you're able to achieve at this level um is is extremely inspiring and, and hopefully that in itself will encourage more participation of, of youth and of females and of 
of people from mixed backgrounds. Um, the, the other thing that's been in the news, and unless you've been under a rock somewhere very far away, is obviously COVID. Um, how has that affected your training regime, um, work, anything else? Um, basically, it stopped my entire season, sadly. Um, I was in Ireland ready for my first event back in March, and we get a phone call halfway through the first day of reconnaissance saying, we're really sorry, we've had to cancel. Um, Ireland's going to close down its borders, so you will need to leave ASAP. And then literally, I got home, and two weeks later, we went into lockdown. So um, the motorsport body like governing body in the uk has decided and um the championship then decided that because they were there's so much uncertainty around what's going on the british championship which what I, which is what i was doing was cancelled so um there's no motorsport out in the uk that i'm hoping to get over to do some competition in belgium and portugal fingers crossed provided every everything prevails but it basically changed changed my whole life covid i mean I've ended up doing online courses and things to keep myself busy and um, I'm just training a lot. So I ended up getting a really good home workout routine going and using my one hour of exercise a day to go for a walk and everything. So I guess it's just given me the chance to focus on myself, but I'm not very good at not being busy. Like I'm used to being out and about all the time. I normally traveling every other weekend to go to events or go testing. So it's been a little bit crazy for me to have such a solid amount of time at home. Yeah, and as you, you talk about your training, and we haven't really talked about that yet, but what, what is your training regime like? What's your diet like? Um, I'm guessing it's all pretty specific and focused. So uh, training, yeah, I do train a lot. Like, um, as much as people don't, like, everyone goes, oh, you're driving a car. What possible reason do you need to be, like, very, very fit to do that? I mean, first of all, there's a lot, of, there's G-force and things in the car, nothing quite like F1, which is why they are extremely fit. But um, being super fit and, um, and training hard allows me, if I do have an accident or anything, to not get injured as much. Like I'll be sore for about a day after an accident and that'll be that, and then I'll be fine. And, um, and that, I think that's very important. But it's also, I think important training also helps your mind I find. So um, by being committed to that and working on that and training not only my body, it gives me a lot more endurance to make it through the whole weekend of a rally. So um, we could be in the car for 18 hours a day sometimes and it gets tiring, but um, being physically fit as well also therefore takes out that extra strain that you would feel by the time that you're really, really tired that you get to the end of the day and you're exhausted because we'll be doing this for three or four days. So um, yeah, so training is I think for anybody is important and especially like focusing on mind and that I do that within my training, which is ideal. Um, and I work with some driver training coaches who help to work on the areas like ankles and small things that you wouldn't really necessarily think of. Like I use left foot braking. So my left ankle and right ankle have to be as strong as each other. So, um, it's making sure that like, your feet don't get tired and your legs and then obviously we're sat down for so long in the day so just making sure that we're able to well, your body's able to cope with it basically so i guess the last thing to round all this off is uh your you know your own ambition the future what it holds for you um, where you hope you're going to be in the next three five ten years um so for me the goal has always been to make it to the top level wrc and that's still the goal today. Um, it's frustrating because obviously I lost a year in the process at the moment with uh, COVID-19, but you know, makes you stronger and makes you want to fight more. So um, definitely to get to the top level. And um, I've got a program and like way of doing that uh, to get there hopefully within the next three to five years. So fingers crossed. Um, and then obviously I have to work on raising unfortunately i picked very expensive sports so um working with people and trying to raise sponsorship money to be able to compete and i'm um, just striving to become yeah become the best of what i do um okay great and, and for those that want to follow your career where's where's the best place uh to, to see that and see what you're up to uh, so you can follow me on social media i have all of the social medias <laughs> facebook instagram TikTok now over lockdown <laughs> and um, Twitter and then you can also follow me via my website I post updates and things like that 
Thank you very much for your time. I'm, I'm sure I speak on behalf of the Jamaat and, and everyone else you're inspiring uh, to say thank you and best of luck. I'm sure a lot of people will be following your career with a lot of excitement, hopefully maybe even be in touch uh, to find out how they can get thank into you. it. Thank you, thank you so much for having me and I hope that I've been able to give some insight into not just motorsport, but sport generally. <laughs> for sure, you definitely have. Um, all right, well, thank you very much and take care.